Well, good morning and welcome to our Monday Bible study. It has been a bit of a while since we've been together. Last week was Vacation Bible School, and uh, we appreciate everybody's prayers for that. Um, we are in Mark chapter 10 as we have followed Jesus throughout the gospel. Uh, a reminder, Mark begins the gospel with the declaration of Jesus' identity, uh, the Son of God um, and the Messiah, the Christ. Uh, and halfway through the gospel, we learn uh, that Jesus is the Messiah from uh, the disciples' uh, proclamation. And Jesus begins in chapter 8, uh, after all of these wonderful things Jesus is doing, the, the gospel of power, some people say, is that first part of Mark's gospel. His focus turns towards Jerusalem and towards his identity as the suffering Messiah, which is opposite of what the disciples have come to want and to know about Jesus. And Jesus continues to tell them what's going to happen, and continually they are trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to have a seat of power. Um, we ended um, last time together in verse 41 through 45 with James and John asking who's going to be um, on the right and the left. And Jesus responds, when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their ru rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So throughout the gospel, we hear Jesus talking about the, the, the way of following Jesus, the way of being God's people in the world, is not to desire to be like the world. And Jesus lives in a world where the Romans are in power and those Gentile rulers have lorded it over them. We've talked about Jesus in Galilee as he's gone about Galilee and we've looked at some of the history and the um, archaeology and the awareness is most of the people that have lived in Galilee their whole lives, generation after generation, no longer on the land. They can't afford to live there anymore, so the land's been bought from them. Landowners are there. The Romans are making money off of them, off of taxes. And life is really hard for them. And a lot of them are working the same land their parents worked or the grandparents worked or the families worked, but it's not theirs anymore. And the reality is they live in a world where there are people that are ruling over them and not treating them very well. In the other Gospels, Jesus tells parables, more parables than he tells in Mark, and he tells one parable about landowners. He tells parables about a, uh, a person who owes a king a great debt. And the reality is people owe him a great debt. And how does he treat the person that owes him a very small debt? Bad? Well, Jesus is telling this parable because people in the audience know what it's like to be under someone else. They know what it's like to wish that they were rulers or lords or somebody else in the world. So when James and John ask, can they sit on the right hand and the left hand, they are asking their wish fulfillment of life. We don't want to be fishermen no more. We want to be something more. We want to be important. And Jesus tells them, it's not to be this way with you. You're to be a servant. You're to be leased. Well, guess what, Jesus? We already are servants. We already are leased in the world. Every time Jesus says these things, we hear them. We, we kind of have an understanding that this is what we've learned since we were children. This is not what James and John and necessarily Peter and others want to hear. Jesus, you've been doing all these wonderful miracles. We know your power. We know your authority. We're looking forward to the time when you're in charge. And maybe all this investment of time, we're going to get something back from it. 
Jesus continues to tell them that's not the way. But it doesn't mean they hear it. So immediately following this, we've already had Jesus healing a, a person in Bethsaida. Now they come to Jericho. And if you, you've got your map, I'm going to give you a map here in a second. Um, we'll wait a second to get the map. But if you had a larger map of, of, of ancient Palestine, so of Galilee, of Samaria, of Judea, of Jerusalem, uh, you would notice that the way Jesus is going is going his his course is always, after Mark 8, always heading towards Jerusalem. So he's in Jericho, uh, on their way to Jerusalem, and as he was leaving his disciples, a large crowd were leaving Jericho. So a large crowd going along are also going to Jerusalem. Because as we'll find out, everybody's heading to Jerusalem for Passover. It's a pilgrimage season. So imagine you are going through Jericho, you're going through this town, and a large crowd is leaving, and there is a man named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. Now if you notice in Mark's Gospel, only a handful of people have really been named outside of Jesus and the disciples. We've got Jairus, um, even people like the Syrophoenician woman and the woman with a hemorrhage doesn't get a name. But notice that this blind beggar, Bartimaeus of Timaeus, has a name. And part of the reason he has a name is because somebody has remembered him because of what he's about to do. Now notice he's a blind beggar sitting on the roadside. Remember that rich, rich man that came to Jesus? He didn't get, we don't know his name. But we know Bartimaeus' name. He's sitting by the roadside. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So this blind man who cannot see Jesus, who has heard Jesus is nearby, starts to yell for Jesus. And he uses the title, son of David. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, there's really not a whole lot of overly references of the son of David, other than Solomon. But you'll find in, in some of the Psalms and other places, and then in the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the son of David is a way of talking about a future hope for a Messiah. So it's a title given to this messianic expectation. Um, There is a hope that the Messiah will come and usher in an era of blessing and healing and acts of mercy. We've talked a little bit about that Essene community, that other community during the time of Jesus that was out in the wilderness at Qumran. And I want to read just an excerpt from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls about this hope for a Messiah uh, during the same period that we find Jesus living and walking and teaching and healing. So the following fragment from Qumran provides evidence of this expectation of a Messiah. For the heavens and the earth will listen to his Messiah, and all that is in them will not turn away from the holy precepts. Be encouraged, you who are seeking the Lord in his service. Will you not perhaps encounter the Lord in it all, those who hope in their heart? For the Lord will observe the devout, they will call just by name, and upon the poor he will place his spirit, and the faithful he will renew his strength, for he will honor the devout upon the throne of the eternal royalty, freeing prisoners, giving sight to the blind, straightening the twisted. Ever shall I cling to those who hope, in mercy he will judge, and from no one shall the fruit of good be delayed. And the Lord will perform marvelous acts such as have not existed, just as he said, for he will hear, heal the badly wounded and will make the dead live. He will proclaim good news to the meek and give lavishly to the needy and lead the exiled and enrich the hungry. So in the first century, there were people looking for a Messiah. And that title, Son of David, in that, that period was one title they would use as the expectation of a messianic figure. So blind Bartimaeus, 
who cannot see calls out to Jesus properly who he is. Son of David, you're the one. Other people that can see can't see Jesus. But old blind Bartimaeus can. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. Throughout the Gospels, a lot of times when Jesus heals somebody, what does he tell them? Not to say anything. Here it's a reversal. It's the crowds telling him to hush up. Be quiet. Already we've seen the disciples try to be brokers to Jesus when the children come to him. No, no, no. No, let them come to me. Here the crowd is trying to be a broker to Jesus. No, no, no. Does he stop? No. He cries out more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. So he's poor, and all he probably owns is his cloak. He's probably taken his cloak already and laid it on the ground, hoping people would what? Give him money. Part of the tradition in um, Israel was that if you heard or saw somebody begging for money, you were supposed to give. Much of the offerings to the temple were supposed to go to the widows, the orphans, and those that are marginalized. This man's only income, the only way he can sustain himself, is from what? Charity. Charity. He leaves everything he has. Where the rich man goes away sad because he can't give up what? Everything. This man gets up, throws off his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, My teacher, Rabbi, let me see again. He wants to see again. He's lost his sight. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight. And what does he do? He followed him on the way. That's a double reference. One, he follows him on the way to Jerusalem, but he also probably becomes a disciple of Jesus because Jesus, as we understand within the early church, they were often people of the way, the way of Jesus. So blind Bartimaeus, who cannot see, sees Jesus more clearly than even his disciples in that previous passage. Because they're still asking Jesus questions that don't matter. Part of the idea of following Jesus is sometimes it takes a while before what? Our vision is clear. When we go back to the previous story of healing of a blind man, the vision is what? it comes clearer and clearer over time. Lord, I see, but it looks as though trees are walking. Here, blind Bartimaeus sees, and as he sees, he throws away everything to follow Jesus. Luke will pair not blind Bartimaeus with the rich young ruler, which came not too far before here, but with Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector. The rich man who is devout cannot give up his riches. Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel is the scum of the earth. He's a tax collector stealing from his own people. He's not devout. And he's willing to give up everything and to make good on everything he's stolen from others to follow Jesus. Oftentimes the people that see and follow Jesus most clearly are the people we would least expect. Usually, sometimes the people on the outside. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. 
Sorry for those watching. I got outside the camera. I hope you, hope you didn't mind. I forgot. I get excited sometimes, you know. As we get into chapter 11 and following, you're going to be more familiar with these passages. Um, they are part of the synoptic story of Jesus' last week, of Holy Week. Um, chapter 11 begins on what we, uh, during the, the season of, of, at the end of Lent, the beginning of Holy Week, is Palm Sunday. Um, and what I'd like for us to do is to begin thinking about some of these things as we go along. I'm going to give you a map. And on your map, it is just a map of Jerusalem in Jesus' time. So over the next couple of weeks as we go through these chapters, it'll give you kind of awareness of where Jesus might be at during the, during the passage. You'll also notice that the map is measured in meters. It's not very big place. You know, a lot of times when we have this picture of Jerusalem during this, it's, everybody's packed in together. This is not a very large space. Um, so I'm going to have somebody that would like to get up and pass these out because I want to stay on the camera, otherwise I get in trouble. If you'll just pass those out. Let me, let me keep one. I might need one. Um. Oh. Okay, thank you. And for those that aren't with us, if you'd like a, a copy of the map, just feel free to email me, and, um, and we'll, we'll get you one. They were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is an important um, place for us to understand. There's this uh, passage in Zephaniah, I think it's, I'll have to look it up, we'll look at it maybe next week. Um, but if we, when we did our minor prophet study a long time ago, there's this idea is that God's Messiah will come and the Mount of Olives is a, an important place. So oftentimes location is important to understand parts of the narrative. So Jesus is near the Mount of Olives and he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. Now listen. Jesus gives a lot of curious uh, instructions to his disciples. You can only imagine the disciples are like, oh, okay. So it's never been written. Okay. So they go and get it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt near a door outside the street. As they were untying it, someone, the bystander says, What are you doing? Untying that colt. They told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. So Jesus essentially is the one who orchestrates his entrance in Jerusalem. And for us, a lot of times we think of... Um, a really large cloud sh crowd showing up, you know, it's kind of our picture. Uh, we, I, we don't know how many people were here. But Jesus is doing a prophetic entrance into Jerusalem. So if you know anything about ancient um, entrances into cities uh, or processions, you know that in the ancient world, uh, processions happened usually after a ruler has conquered an area. And they would come into the city in a procession. I'm going to read some of the um, characteristics often found in those processions from our, um, one of our commentaries. The conqueror or ruler is escorted into, ex escorted into the city by the citizenry or the army of the conquered. 
So notice who is escorting Jesus into the city. It's the people. People that have probably been following Jesus onward from as he comes into Jerusalem. And people that probably live in Jerusalem. His disciples and others. Okay? The procession is accompanied by hymns and or acclamations. Hosanna, Hosanna. You all know what that means? Save us. Save us. Save us. What do they want saving from? We've been talking about it. Roman oppression. The Roman triumph was shown, shown us very elements in the procession, symbolically depict the authority of the ruler. So when the Romans would come in, they would often bring in things with them that showed them their power and authority. Um, what does Jesus do? He sits on the side of a colt. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. The entrance is followed by a ritual appropriation such as sacrifice, which takes place in the temple, whereby the ruler symbolically appropriates the city. The end of the week, Jesus comes to the city. Sorry, fellas, ladies online. I keep moving. I need a camera operator. But Jesus comes into the city as the conqueror. And where is the sacrifice given? Is it at the temple? It's on the cross. Most conquerors don't come into a city until they've conquered the city. Jesus comes in before he's done anything. Saying that he, one, is the Messiah without having to say it. Two, that his way of doing things is going to be opposite than everybody else's. How do empires, how do rulers, how do armies win what is the way people win force, force and violence how would Jesus win by laying his life down by sacrifice by being the victim rather than being the victimizer And at this point in the story, the disciples still don't get it. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, it was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus comes in, just looks around in Mark's gospel. Now Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John tell the story a little differently. In Luke's gospel, Jesus will look over the city and lament. Because he will, he will lament because the city did not know what it meant to have peace. Jerusalem, you can even hear it in the name Jerusalem, was always meant to be the city of Shalom, of peace, of God's peace. And yet, by the end of the week, it will end in what? End in violence. And by within the next 20, 30 years, it will be totally destroyed. So Jesus comes in as the Messiah, but he also come in just like those prophets before, like Isaiah and Jeremiah proclaiming that the time is coming where the city will be destroyed. And the reason the city is destroyed is because what? The people want to fight the Romans. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah reminds them that Babylon is really, really big. And you can align yourself with those like Egypt, but it's only going to make it worse. 
Here, the story is the Jewish revolt that happens against the Romans only makes it worse. People will be executed in large numbers. Women and children will die. And they wanted somebody like Jesus to come in and to win through violence. Yet Jesus offers another way. On the following day, when they came to Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So Jesus sees a fig tree. He is hungry. He goes to the fig tree. It is not the season for figs. He said to it, May you never ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. You've been with Jesus a while. Jesus does some unpredictable things. He's over there talking to a fig tree. Now, is he talking to it? He's angry with it. And it's not even time for figs. I've got a note here from years ago. I'm going to go back and look at it real quick. In 8.13 of the, the book of Jeremiah, uh, the prophet writes, When I of God, when I wanted to gather them, says the Lord, there were no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves were withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. Jesus comes to Jerusalem during a period of time, and what does he find? He doesn't find the fruit that God has wanted. The fig tree is going to represent in many ways the temple and the temple will represent the worship of God's people. They came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he would not allow anyone to carry anything out through the temple and he was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. So Jesus has come into the temple the night before. He's looked around. He comes in the next day, and what he does is in many ways similar to what Jeremiah does. In, if you go back and read, the prophet does symbolic acts to represent something big. Here, Jesus chases out those who are buying and selling in the temple, overturning the money changers' uh, tables, and not allowing anyone uh, to go in to carry about what they're doing. Now, we know the temple is fairly big. Jesus is only at one place. But he makes a scene. Now, part of us, we come back to the story, and a lot of people say, well, Jesus gets mad, and, and he can get violent sometimes. He's not violent here. He's not attacking anybody. What he's doing is making a prophetic statement about what's going on, because what's going on here is not right. Lots of people are coming in Jerusalem to worship the week of Passover the week that they have come to remember God's liberation from Pharaoh. They will enact the Passover meal, that hurried meal of the Israelites before they were to leave after the plagues that have come and that last plague. That last plague where there was a sacrifice and the lamb's blood put what? On a door and a hurried meal. Two images that will come back during this week to take new meaning for the followers of Jesus. A sacrificial lamb and a hurried meal. Jesus comes into a temple. All of these people have been coming. Many of them, this may be the only trip they make to Jerusalem. Maybe it's a yearly trip. It costs money for them to get there. These people are not rich. These are people from Galilee and other places that work their whole lives. And they have very little. 
and they get to the temple and there are people making money off of their worship. And they're not making a little bit of money, they're making pretty good money. Because several things have to happen for you to go into the temple. If you want to give an offering in the temple, you cannot take your Roman coins in there. Why? They got the image of what on it? Caesar. Caesar. It also has some words on there that we're going to hear again later. Words like Son of God. King of kings. Lord of lords. Same words that the early church uses for Jesus as a response to an empire that is not really the kingdom of God. They have to exchange their money for temple money. And guess what you do when you exchange money? Y'all have exchanged money when you've gone on trips. What do they charge? A fee. A fee. They are charging a fee to give an offering to God. And guess what? It's a high holy season. Y'all have been to uh, places when it's, uh, when, when it's peak season? or prices less or more during that season? More. Yeah, there are more. You think it would be less, but it's not. It's the opposite. Because what? You can do it. Not only that, there are people selling doves and other things so you can offer a sacrifice. You were supposed to bring your sacrifice. But it's hard going from one place to another and carrying your sacrifice. So you could get there and you could buy a sacrifice to give at the... And Jesus looks at this and understands that the sacrifices they're selling probably aren't all that good. How many of y'all go to a ball game? This ain't a sacrifice. Maybe y'all go to a ball game. Y'all know how much a hot dog costs? Don't you? You know how much a good hot dog costs? How much does a hot dog cost at a ball game? Well, it costs probably 10 times, 20 times more than the actual hot dog costs. They give them scrawny little pigeons, doves, for sacrifice. These are not choice animals. And the problem is, what does that, what does that say about the worship of God? Not only are we selling these things, we're not even offering the best of what we have. It becomes what? Commercial. Worship should always be sacrificial, but it should never come at the cost of the poor. And here it is an oppressive act of what's happening. Some of the same oppressive acts Jesus will mention as he goes into the temple and sees others doing things that make them richer, that make them feel better about themselves at the cost of the poor. Where the temple was always meant, the offerings were always to go to the priests, the Levites, and then to the poor. And here, just like in the Old Testament, the prophets that come and charge against those that operate the temple, they're doing the very same things. Jesus has called his disciples to be what? Least. Jesus associates the kingdom of God with what? The least. So when Jesus sees the least being oppressed, not by the Romans, not by the Gentiles, but by their own people, you can hate the tax collector, but you're doing the same thing. That's frustrating, ain't it? We don't see any of that today, do we? Y'all have never flipped around TV and seen somebody trying to take the poorest of the poorest people's money. You just send me some money and you'll get healed. You just send me some money and things will get better. You just got to believe. Who are they 
you taken advantage of? We see it today. They don't live poor, do they? No. And they get away without paying taxes, too. I'm not trying to hit on everybody, but y'all know. I've seen good people send money in to people that will never see them or never know them. They'll sell books on, on how, to get, how to get a blessing. I mean, the, the people still do the same thing. When the chief priest and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Jesus doesn't stay in the city during part of this week. There's a reason. You get out of Dodge occasionally. He's got a mark on him. When he does stay in the city later in the week, they're going to find him and get him. Jesus is causing problems. Now, it's not all the Pharisees, it's not all the scribes, it's not all of the priests, but it's those that have something to lose. Because Jesus is challenging, and not only that, people are listening. In the morning they passed by, and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, teacher, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea. And if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. For if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, this mountain will be taken up and thrown into the sea. What is Jesus saying there? You got your Bibles. Um, let me find my passage here. Not sure why I got to. If you can stay faithful to God, part of our idea of faith is is good and bad, I think, in Baptist tradition. We, we talk about faith as a belief, a trust. And that's true. But faith is also loyalty. Pistis, the word used mostly by Paul about faith, means to have loyalty. It's hard to have loyalty, isn't it? Jesus says you can't have two masters. You're going to be loyal to one and hate the other. Here, have loyalty in God. Truly I tell you, if you say this mountain be taken up, thrown to sea, if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. Jesus is using hyperbole. You can believe that, what, mountain's going to be thrown to sea. That's not what he's talking about. Part of what's going to happen this week is Jesus is going to enact what true loyalty is, what true faith in God is. It's going to go to a place that is hard and difficult to go. And it's only in that place that mountain will be moved. And he says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now we can take that out of context and say, what? Lord, I believe I'm going to get that million dollar settlement. <laughs> Part of what we have to do is go back to the other Gospels and, and think about, especially in Matthew, when Matthew talks about what it is to search, to knock, uh, to ask. And you will find. 
The question is, when we pray, what are we searching for? What are we asking for? What do we want? And it should always go back to the question, not my will, but yours. Are we searching for God's will? Are we knocking for God's will? Are we asking for God's will? Later in Mark's Gospel, Jesus will be praying, and what will he pray? Not my will be done, but what? Yours. If we pray for God's will, and we trust we are loyal to God in our hearts and our minds and our bodies, we will receive what God wants us to do, to be, and to know. But in that kind of prayer life, Jesus reminds us, just as Jesus reminded in Matthew's Gospel, when you are praying, understand that your relationship with God in prayer correlates with your relationship with other people. They are not mutually exclusive. You cannot live in a silo with God and a silo with people. They are interwoven and interconnected. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you or your trespasses. Jesus says, after the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6, after he's just taught his disciples how to pray, Father, forgive them their trespasses or their debts, depending on which translation you use, as, you forgive, as I forgive them. Jesus says, if you do not forgive others, then God cannot forgive you. That stings, doesn't it? Our relationship with God and our relationship with others are interwoven. We cannot live a life of faith without a life of forgiveness with other people. And our forgiveness is dependent on God, but God requires us to forgive others and to seek reconciliation with others. That's hard, isn't it? It'd be a lot easier to go to the temple and sacrifice something and just say, I'm done with that. It's a lot harder to sacrifice ourselves in trying to forgive other people. Now, how many of you don't struggle with that? <laughs> And just like um, in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, and He says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. I'm always reminded that I need daily bread and I need to forgive and be forgiven every day. There is not a day that goes by that I haven't done something or have had something done to me, small or big, that I don't need to either ask forgiveness for or to let go of. If you're married, you know what that's like. <laughs> if you got children, you know what that's like. If you live in 2024 amongst people that don't agree with anything, you know what that's like. Because just like having loyalty to God, and you can't be loyal to God and manna, Jesus has said earlier in the gospel. You can't be loyal to God and have a master of your life that is anger and frustration and unforgiveness. Because over time, if that becomes the thing that guides you and motivates you and rules you, then it will be the thing that dictates your life and how you respond to other people. Let's stop there. Do y'all have any thoughts, comments? I'm going to pray for us and we can talk just a, a minute or two about these. Continue to read in Mark. Um, as you do so, notice some of the stories that uh, Mark tells. And if you have an opportunity, flip over to, to Matthew and to Luke and even to John, which tells a very different version of the last week of Jesus. Um, and, and begin to think about some of the things that Jesus is saying and doing. And how do we see those today as 
just as hard today. If Jesus were to come to our world and enact and say some of these things, how stinging it still would be. Because what Jesus is saying and doing, we have to understand, isn't regulated just to Holy Week. We shouldn't just read these stories during Lent. It's like the, 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 the early stories of Jesus in the gospel. We shouldn't just regulate that to Christmas. These are stories we should read and understand and, and ask ourselves in our day-to-day -day when so many things are happening and we hear so many people talk about God in certain terms or what it means to be a Christian in certain terms or what worship is in certain terms. How would Jesus get into that conversation and say, listen, these are the things you should be focused on. Let me pray for us. If y'all have any questions, comments, we will talk about it. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity we have regularly to come together to open and to read and study your word. Lord, we're thankful because we can do it openly and publicly and we know that there are fellow believers around the world that struggle just with that liberty. Let us not take it for granted. Lord, let us continue to hear Jesus' words that are still just as powerful, just as convicting today. And Lord, some of the things Jesus says can make us upset, just like it made the scribes and the chief priest, and even the Pharisees upset. Help us, Lord, to hear them and to follow in the way of Jesus. And Lord, in the areas of our lives where we might be a little blind, we pray for better vision. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you went the way of the cross for us and for the world. And you call us to do the same. Help us, Lord, in a world that is full of violence, full of animosity, full of judgment and name-calling. Help us, Lord, to live the alternative way of Jesus. One that calls for forgiveness sacrificial love, and to be a servant rather than tyrants. We pray all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.